Okay, so today we're going to go over great faith, authority, and persistence, and this will probably take two or three sessions. Okay, so great faith, understanding authority. So there are two times in the Bible that Jesus said somebody had great faith. So there's there's only two times. Now, he did mention on other occasions that, you know, that people did have faith, but only twice did he use the term great faith. And so one of them was a Roman centurion, and he understood the concept of authority. We're going to read that passage in a minute. And the second time, there was a mother from Canaan, and she was persistent and insistent that Jesus heal her daughter. And so from this, we see that there are two major characteristics which Jesus considers to be necessary ingredients to have great faith. So to have great faith, you must understand authority, and you must be persistent and insistent not backing down until you have the thing that you were after. And those two qualities are extremely important and necessary to have great faith. So obviously we want to have great faith. So let's read Matthew 8, 5 to 10. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Okay, so you have a person who's not even, you know, he's not even a Jew. He's um, a Roman. You know, he's a centurion. So he's a Roman centurion. And if you read in Luke 7, 3, um, let me just read that real quick. It says, when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to Jesus requesting him to come and save the life of his slave. So in the other gospel, in the gospel of Luke, it tells that the centurion heard about Jesus. So he heard that Jesus was operating in authority. He heard that Jesus was ministering by commanding sicknesses and commanding evil spirits. And so therefore he realized that sickness and evil spirits, they had to obey Jesus's commands. Okay, so um, he he understood the concept of authority. You know, being a centurion, a centurion is somebody who has a hundred men underneath him, right? So that's the definition of a centurion. So he's in the military, he has a hundred people underneath him, and he's in charge. And so he understood authority because, you know, he said, all he has to do is speak a word, you know, for those under him. And he tells them, you know, to go, they go, to come, they will come, to do something, and they will do it. So whatever he commands as a centurion being above them, um, they will obey his command. And so he recognized that Jesus was operating the same way. He recognized that sickness and evil spirits, they had to obey Jesus's command. He recognized that Jesus was only speaking a word and commanding, and then these things had to obey his command. And so he recognized that Jesus was operating in authority. And so Um, Jesus declared that he had great faith because he understood that concept of authority. And so as a result of that, you know, he told Jesus, you know, come and heal my servant. And actually, Jesus offered to come to his house and heal the servant. But he said, all you have to do is speak a word, right? And so authority works simply by giving a command. So the first part is we have to recognize that we're above. Like, so for example, this centurion knew that he was in charge. He was above the hundred soldiers that were under him. So he knew that he was in a position of authority. He knew that the people under him had to obey. He had an expectation that when he gives a command, his soldiers will carry it out. Okay, so apart from knowing that he's above them, apart from issuing commands to them, apart from expecting them to do the things he says, you know, if, if, if those things weren't there, then he would be ineffective. Okay, but authority, to operate in authority, you have to know that you're above, you have to know that you're in charge, and then you have to issue commands expecting what you command to be done, and then it will be done 
as you believe. Amen? Okay, so authority works by issuing commands. The one who is above, the superior one, commands the one who is below, the subordinate one, and they must obey. And what we need to do is we need to realize that we have absolute authority over Satan and all of his works. And we have a responsibility, which is we must resist the devil by exercising authority to command him and his works to go in the name of Jesus. Amen? Okay, so on the very first page of our Bible, in Genesis 1, to 28, it says, Let man have dominion. So God's intention from day one, from the very beginning, was that man should have dominion, you know, in other words, have authority over all the earth and everything in it. Okay, so we were put in charge of the earth. God made the earth as a place for man to rule and reign over. Amen? So God's desire is that um, mankind be in charge of all things on the earth. And in fact, God literally gave the earth to man. Okay, so we're going to see that from Psalm 115. So in verse 126 of Genesis, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Okay, and then I want to read Psalm 115, 16, and then we'll talk about it. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Okay, so importantly, you know, during creation, you know, God created, um, you know, God created the earth and the animals and the plants, and then he literally, he gave this to man. The earth he has given to the children of men. So the heavens belong to God, but the earth he gave to us, and he gave us the earth, and you know, he made us in his image and in his likeness. And part of his image is that, you know, he's a ruler and he rules and reigns over the heavens. And he made us in, in his image and in his likeness. So he wanted us to have a domain to be in charge of, a place to dwell in, a place to rule and reign over, and that place is earth. So he literally gave the earth to us and he put us in charge of it. So his intention was not that he was going to personally rule and reign the earth, but that man would rule and reign the earth and that we would do it according to his goodwill. Okay, so that was his intention. Okay, so he literally, he gave us dominion over all the life in the earth. He gave us dominion over fish, over birds, over cattle, over all the earth. Okay, all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So basically, God put us in entirely in charge of everything in the earth he put us in charge of all the creatures all the life forms and all the earth itself so that would include even the weather would be part of the earth so we literally on day one of man's existence he gave us dominion over everything in the earth okay he, and, and and in fact he doesn't he doesn't say only the things you can see he says over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth well, we know from Genesis chapter 3 that the devil um, was in the earth, and in fact, he was tempting mankind. So he was a living thing in the earth. We had authority over all the earth. The devil was in the earth. So literally, even on day one, Adam and Eve truly had authority over the devil himself. Okay? And unfortunately, that got ruined when they sinned because they bowed the knee to him. Okay? And then, you know, in Psalm 115 verse 16, he gave the earth to us. And so God's intention was not to personally rule and reign the earth. God's intention was for man, who is made in his likeness, for us to have a place to rule and reign. So he wanted us to exercise dominion. Just as he has dominion, he wanted us to, to have the same. Okay? So that's really good news, right? So in the beginning, it was really good news. Um, and then, unfortunately, you know, as I said, we sinned and we temporarily handed off that authority to the devil, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so if we go on to verse 28, um, we see that then God blessed man and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, 
over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay, so again, he's telling us, he's reinforcing that we have absolute rulership over the earth. We have absolute rulership over all the creatures in the earth. But he also said that we needed to do something. So somehow the devil ended up on this earth. And so there were things that were unruly. There was evil. And so he, he told us that we needed to subdue the earth. Fill the earth and subdue it. Okay, and that word subdue is the Hebrew word kabosh. And kabosh means to tread down. So like if you had an, an enemy, you would need to tread them down. If there was evil, you would tread it down. You would you know, basically um, exercise authority to crush it, right? Um, disregard, kabosh means to conquer, you know, conquer the evil in the earth, conquer all unruly things, subjugate. So if there's evil, you need to subjugate it, um, make it become, make it come into alignment with God's will, bring into bondage. Okay, so um, one of the things Jesus said is that whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so we should really, part of our responsibility is to bind up the devil and all of his evil works. And so that is a definition of the word kabosh. So when he, he gave us the earth, he told us to subdue it. One aspect of that is to bring all evil and the evildoers into bondage. Amen? To stop their evil works. Um, to subdue, to bring into subjection, okay? So anything evil, anything out of alignment with God's will, it is our responsibility from day one to subdue it, to bring it into subjection, to make it bow down and align with the will of God. Okay, so that was man's responsibility from the very beginning, okay? Okay, then, um, then again, that same commission is restated in the New Testament. So in Romans 8, verses 19 to 21, it says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Okay, so this is kind of a wordy passage, but basically it's telling us we have the same responsibility as was stated in verse 28 of Genesis chapter 1. So he says that creation is eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Okay, well, Jesus was the first son of God, and we are the second sons of God. Okay, and just as Jesus was destroying the works of the devil, we are to do all the same works that Jesus was doing, and we are to destroy the works of the devil. Okay, and so creation has been waiting for us um, because we have the responsibility to deliver creation from the bondage of corruption. So that would be from the devil's, all the works of the devil, all the corruption that he's put in place. We are responsible to deliver creation from all this evil corruption. Okay, we, the children of God, will bring forth this glorious liberty, this glorious freedom to all of creation. And in order to do that, we have to operate in the dominion and authority that God has given to us. And so, and then what we have to do is we have to subdue all the evil works. We have to subdue all the corruption in the earth. We have to subdue and tread down, crush, destroy all the works of the devil. So that is, that is our responsibility. Now, a lot of people ask, you know, why isn't God doing this? Why isn't God doing that? The reality is it's our responsibility. So God has equipped us. You know, he's given us authority. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us his power. But it's our responsibility to take those tools and rule and reign this earth and make it come into alignment with his will. So that is our responsibility. So he's not going to do it for us because he's given us that job description. Amen? So that's what we need to be busy doing, or one of the things anyway. Okay, so here we want to look at some passages that tell us, you know, God has given us the authority to tread down the devil, to trample him, to crush him, to bind him, and to cast him and his works out. Amen? So number one, so we are not to be subjected to Satan and his evil will, 
Believers have authority over the devil, and it is our responsibility to destroy his works. Okay, that is our job description. Jesus has equipped us, and now we have to carry it out. Jesus demonstrated what needs to be done, and we need to continue doing what he was doing. Okay, and God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He has made us sons of God who are born again by the Spirit of God. He has given us his authority. He has given us the Holy Spirit. He has given us his divine, miraculous power. He's given us his word and his goodwill. So now we are equipped just like Jesus was. Now it is our responsibility to exercise our God-given authority to subject all evil to the will of God. Amen? So this is our responsibility. Now, um, again, many people are, how come God is allowing this? How come God is allowing that? Um, why isn't God destroying this evil work? Again, it is our responsibility. He gave us the earth as our domain, and it's our job to rule and reign over the earth and bring it into alignment with his will. That's our job description. Okay, in James 4, 7, it says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay, and so the scripture says that we need to be submitted to God, so we need to know the will of God. We need to bring our lives into alignment with God. We need to live in a way that's well-pleasing to him. So um, we we need to live like Jesus. We need to imitate him. We need to live holy, be holy. You know, so we need to learn the will of God and align to it, basically. Okay, then we also have a responsibility to resist the devil, and he will flee from us. And so there are three major ways in which we resist the devil. So one way is we resist the devil by commanding him, by operating in authority. So that's number one. And that's the context for this particular passage or this page. Secondly, we resist the devil's temptations. Uh, and third, we resist the devil by casting down whatever ungodly things he says to us, you know, whatever ungodly thoughts we have or that other people speak to us. We have to cast down the thoughts of the devil. Okay. So those are the three ways that we resist the devil. So in the context of this teaching, we're talking about authority. So we need to resist the devil by exercising our authority. So if he tries to bring sickness upon someone, we resist him using authority. If he tries, tries to bring strife or chaos or overflow of work into your job, you resist him with authority. So whatever work the devil is trying to do against you or against someone that you're ministering to, um, our responsibility is to resist him with authority and make him flee. Okay, and I want to read. I want to read Second Corinthians one eighteen to twenty, because you'll notice, like all over this page, I've highlighted in yellow, um, will, shall, will, shall, will, will, like all these words. Okay, there's a reason for that. In Second Corinthians one eighteen to twenty, it says, "But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no." For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Okay, so the, the Holy Spirit says through Paul that every promise of God, the answer is yes, period. He's not maybe. He's not yes for AJ, no for Bobby, yes for Joe, no for you know anyone else. Any promise of God, the answer is yes for every single person. So importantly then, since he says every promise, the answer is yes, and we will find all the promises in the Bible, and if there's a requirement, fulfill that requirement, then the answer is yes. Okay, and so here the, the requirement is be submitted to God. Okay, so we are all believers in Jesus, so we're submitted to God in that regard. We want to, our lives to be in alignment with, with the will of God. Okay, so that's important. Then we have a requirement to resist the devil. So exercise your authority against him. Don't bow down to him. Don't let him bring sickness upon you. Don't let him bring a trial upon you. But if he tries an evil work against you, then you have to resist him. You have to use your authority. And when you use your authority against the devil, he will promise of God, flee. Okay, so anywhere 
in the Bible, you find will or shall, will or shall, will, 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 will. Anywhere you find that, that, that indicates a promise. It's a commitment. Okay, and so all these commitments are promises of God. And that means if you fulfill the requirement, if you do what the scripture tells you to do, then what God says will happen. Amen? So when we resist the devil using our authority, he will flee from us. Amen? It's a promise of God. The answer is yes. Now, sometimes the devil, um, he may try and resist. He may test our faith. He may be stubborn and, and you know, go slowly. But we need to stand our ground. We need to be insistent and persistent. And that's the second half of this teaching. So sometimes we pray once and it's finished. Other times, you know, it's like we're in a boxing ring for 10 rounds and we need to stay in the fight, keep exercising our authority, keep coming against the work of the devil. And if we keep, if we keep getting up, if he knocks us down, we're going to win. Amen. So we don't back down. Keep resisting and he will flee from us. All right. So that's good news. Then in Psalm 91, 13, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot. Okay, so we are the ones who shall do the treading. Okay, so whoever is doing the treading, whoever is doing the trampling, that's the one who's winning. That's the one who's in charge. So, you know, you could trample a roach under your foot, you know, because you have power over that roach and you don't like him. He's your enemy, so you crush him under your foot. Well, the devil is beneath us. You know, we're born again. We have been redeemed from the devil's kingdom. We have been redeemed out from the devil's authority. We are above the devil. We are above. And so once we learn that we are above, then he's going to start losing whenever he tries to oppress us. But if we don't realize that we're above him and we allow him to oppress us, then then he's going to continue to, to dominate over us. But literally, and we'll look at it on the next page, literally when we are born again, we are pulled out from under the devil's authority and we are put above him. And now he is beneath our feet. And so we need to recognize that he's beneath our feet and we need to exercise our authority. And then literally we will tread down and destroy all evil. You know, lions and cobras um, being representations of evil in this passage. Amen. We tread down evil. We trample evil under our feet. We are not to be trampled by the devil. He may try, but once we learn our authority and we resist him and we command him and we exercise authority over him, then we trample him and uh, he's going to want to stop coming around. Amen. His attacks will become fewer and fewer. Just like um, you could read the passage about the seven sons of Sceva. You know, the devils knew who Paul was. They knew who Jesus was. They knew who Paul was. Um, they didn't know who these seven sons of Sceva were, and so they attacked and overcame those seven guys, unfortunately. Okay, so Paul had a reputation in hell, so did Jesus, and we want to have a reputation in hell so that whenever we are around, the devil doesn't want to be anywhere near us because he knows we're going to tread him down and trample him and that we want him to rather avoid that rather than to engage with us. Amen. Okay, then Jesus explicitly said in Luke 10, 19, um, and he's speaking to disciples, and, and we are disciples of Jesus, so he's speaking to us also. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. All right, so Jesus literally gives his very own authority to his disciples, which includes us. He gives us his authority to trample, to destroy, you know, all workers of Satan and all the works of Satan. Because he said he gives us authority over serpents and scorpions. Okay, these would be workers of the devil. So demons, right? Demons, sicknesses, spirits of infirmity, any of that kind of thing. Okay, we have authority over all the workers of Satan. Okay, we have authority over all of the devil's power. Well, his power, what are manifestations of his power? Manifestations of his power would be sickness, would be uh, insanity, would be mental illness, would be all physical illnesses, what could be deadly weather. You know, so you can make a long list and we'll look at a picture of this in a minute. But we have authority over all of his power. We have authority over all the works of the devil. 
We have authority over the devil himself. In fact, the devil should be afraid of us and we should not be afraid of him. Amen? Now, he, he talks loud and he's powerful, but he is scared of us. When we learn and start participating and engaging and using that authority that Jesus has given us, the devil is literally afraid of us and we should not be afraid of him. All right, and then Romans 16, 20. It says, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet with speed and quickness. Okay, so literally, that word surely is not surely. It literally, it means with speed and quickness. So there's no, there's, there's no delay. Like when you, okay, when you put your foot upon somebody, that's, that's a figure of speech for exercising your authority. Okay, so God will crush Satan under our feet. So if we put the if we put our foot upon the devil, that means we have exerted our God-given authority over the devil. And we exert our authority over the devil primarily by commanding. So we need to command the devil, command sickness to get out of a person's body, command the cabal to be stripped of power. You know, we need to command certain things to be done. We need to use authority and command the works of the devil to go, command the devils to go. You know, whatever he's doing, we need to exercise authority over it. And so when we exercise our authority, figuratively, we are putting our foot upon him. And when we put our foot upon the devil, it causes the power of God will flow and the devil will be crushed with speed and with quickness. And so the, the minute, I mean, the second we exercise our authority, the power of God begins to flow and operate in that situation. And, and again, sometimes require, sometimes persistence and insistence is required and other times is not necessary. And of course, we appreciate when it's not necessary, but if we are diligent, well, we will win in every situation. If we don't back down, if we are persistent and insistent, we will win every time. Amen? All right, then in Matthew 16, 18 to 19, it says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, so Jesus is saying that um, that the devil and his kingdom, you know, Hades, the kingdom of Hades, the kingdom of the devil, shall not prevail against his church. Okay, this word is ecclesia. That's just the body of believers. So that's all of us. The devil and his kingdom shall not prevail against us. Shall not. That's a promise. Okay, well, how do we cause this shall not to happen? Well, um, he says that he gives us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Okay, the, the keys to the kingdom of heaven is simply the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen? So he has given us um, his very own authority. Jesus has, like right here in Luke 10, 19, he literally gave us authority. He has given us authority to bind on earth and whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. He's given us authority, you know, a key of the kingdom. He's given us authority to loose. So whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, so what does that mean? So if you think about, let's just look at some examples. So remember the lady that was hunched hunched over for 18 years. Um, she had a spirit of infirmity. She could in no way raise herself up. And Jesus said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. So he loosed her. He set her free from that spirit of infirmity that had her bound up. And so when, you know, so he exercised authority to, to cause that, that spirit of infirmity to leave her body. And he said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Loose just means she was set free. So she was set free from that demon that had her bound up in a hunchback position for 18 years. Okay, so that's an example of loosing. So loosing is just, you know, you have the authority to set someone free. So if somebody is in a bondage of sickness, you have the authority to set them free. If somebody is in a bondage of strife or chaos, you have the authority to set them free. If somebody, you know, whatever bad situation somebody could be in, you have the authority to loose them from that work of the devil. Amen? So, and then you also have the authority to bind. 
you know, to stop whatever the devil is doing. So, for example, remember the boy that was epileptic and the, the spirit would seize him and throw him in the fire and throw him in the water trying to kill him. And, and Jesus, when he cast that spirit out, he said, and enter him again no more. Enter him again no more. And so when he said those words, enter him again no more, what is he doing? He is binding up that devil. He, he bound that particular devil so that devil cannot enter that boy again. And so it's as if he arrested the demon, right? And so the things on earth are copies of the things in heaven. Just as on earth you have people who, like police officers, and they, they do the will of the community, right? So they, the city has given the police officer authority to stop crimes, you know, to, he has given, the city has given a police officers the authority to set people free. Like if a robbery is in progress, the police officer will go in and, and break up the situation. And the people that were, the victims would be loosed from that uh, oppression of that robber or that criminal. Okay. And then the police officer doesn't just stop there. He doesn't just, you know, stop the crime and everybody goes about their business. He stops the crime. In other words, he looses the victims in the situation. But then he also binds up the enemy. He binds up the criminal. He handcuffs them and takes them to jail. And so things on earth are copies of things in heaven. So we have the authority of Jesus Christ to bind up, you know, not only just cast the devil out, which would be loosing a person, but bind him up. Tell him that you shall not enter this person again, and thereby you have bound and forbidden and prevented any future work of that devil. Amen? And so we want to do binding and we want to do loosing. Okay, then in John 14, 12, Jesus tells us that everything that he was doing, anyone who believes in him, we will do those same things as well. So he says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. So Jesus said, he who believes in me. So every one of us here today we believe in Jesus. That means we are qualified for this passage to be true for us. So he says, he who believes in me, the works that I do, we will do also. Okay, so think about all the works that Jesus was doing. So he spent a good portion of his time destroying the works of the devil. And so he was healing the sick. He was casting out demons. He was raising the dead. He was um, bringing forth supernatural provision, like multiplying the food, you know, bringing forth tax money. So he was doing all of this work. He was destroying the works of the devil. And, and that means that we also are to do the same works that he did, destroy the works of the devil. If Jesus, if Jesus was healing the sick, then we do the same work. We believe in Jesus. Therefore, we are authorized to do the same work of healing the sick. We're authorized to do the same work of casting out demons. We're authorized to do the same work of raising the dead. We are authorized to do the same work of destroying poverty and bringing forth provision, supernatural provision. So all these things that Jesus was doing, um, he said, we will do the same things. So we are authorized by Jesus to do all the same works that he was doing and even greater works. Amen. Okay, but um, if we look at 1 John 3, 8, it says that um, he who sins is of the devil for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay, so we have John 14, 12 in combination with 1 John 3, 8. Jesus was busy destroying the works of the devil. Therefore, we shall be busy destroying the works of the devil. We have been authorized and equipped to do the same works that Jesus was doing. We are authorized to continue destroying the works of the devil. And that is in perfect alignment with what we saw in Genesis chapter 1, where we are to subdue the earth, which means to bring all the evil and unruly things in the earth into alignment um, with the will of God. And this is also in agreement with what it says in Romans chapter 8, where it says that creation is waiting for us to rise up as sons of God and set creation free from the devil's bondage of corruption. Okay, so that requires us to do work. God has done his work. You know, Jesus has given us his authority. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us his power. He's given us his, um, his word and his goodwill. Now it's our responsibility to continue destroying the works of the devil 
and to bring this earth into alignment with the will of God. That is our responsibility. Jesus started it and we continue it. Okay, and then one more. So in Mark 16, 17 to 18, it says, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Okay, so again, we see throughout Mark 16, we see all these will, all these passages with the word will. Again, these are promises of God. These are commitments. And so if we fulfill the requirements of the passage, the answer is yes. So he, Jesus said that anyone who believes, and again, that's going to be all of us here. We believe in Jesus. Therefore, we will, promise of God, cast out demons. That means we have been given authority. Jesus has given us his authority to cast out demons, and we shall exercise authority in the name of Jesus, and the demons will flee. Amen? He has commissioned us. He has authorized us. He has given us his authority, his spirit, and his power so that us believers, we will lay hands on the sick, and they will, promise of God, recover. So we have authority over all sickness. We have authority to heal the sick. Amen? So, um, on this page, we've seen you know a multitude of passages that prove God has given us authority. God has an expectation for us to destroy the works of the devil. He has an expectation for us that um, the devil and his kingdom shall not prevail against us, but that requires us to be exercising our keys to the kingdom of heaven, which are the keys of authority to set people free and the keys of authority to stop and to bind the devil. So we have a responsibility. We must exercise our authority. And when we do, the devil will not prevail against us. Instead, we will tread and trample him. He will be crushed under our feet. Amen? Okay, so um, I'm going to stop on the teaching here. So what we'll do next time, we'll look at, you know, God has put us in a position of authority. So we are literally above the devil. We'll look at that. We will look at this uh, picture and get some ideas of things we have responsibility or, or I'm sorry, we have authority over and then therefore responsibility to come against. And then we'll talk about persistence and insistence.